First up is Dr. Jeremy Scheffner, and he's going to talk about the clinical trials in ALS MND. Where are we now? So, huge welcome, and over to you. Well, thank you, Aisling, and, and thank you for inviting me to this session. It, it, I'm, I'm very happy to be here, and hello to everybody here. And uh, let me just emphasize one thing that she said. I, I'm, I'm going to talk for about a half an hour, but if there's anything that, uh, that I'm talking about that raises a question, feel free just to hold your hand up, and I'll try to, uh, I'll try to be looking out, and we can, we can address them whenever it comes up. So the, the schedule for today is I, I'm going to talk about uh, drugs. Um, and and uh, um, John, John Glass, who will follow me, will talk primarily about, about stem cell trials. And Dr. Velding, who follows after that, will be talking about genetics. So we're splitting things up roughly in, in, that, in that way. And, and I, I just want to start with, with saying that I know, you know, when, when I see patients and, and, and um, when, I, when I go to support groups, I, it, it, we, we talk about the things that we have not achieved. But in fact, compared to other diseases, we're, 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 we're well on the way, I think, to, to effective therapies in, in a way that some other fields are not. Um, we have an increasing number of basic scientists who are working in the field. Um, we're learning more and more about the genetics of ALS um, that will lead directly to thera therapies. And in fact, you know, the early trials in genetic therapies were, were in the first wave. So there is a... a, a, a trial to modify a genetic, uh, uh, genetic expression already underway in, in, in ALS that's uh, caused by the SOD1 gene. There's going to be another trial uh, in, uh, to, to modify the C9 ORF72 gene, which together those two genes cause more than half of the, the inherited ALS that, that, that exists in the world. And, and so we we're doing some novel things that other fields are just starting to do. Um, as Dr. Glass will talk about, we were, were pioneers in, in stem cell treatments, directly injecting st uh, stem cells into spinal cord. Um, we're, 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 it, we're about to look at uh, gen uh, genetic therapies in, in introduced by, vir by, by viral uh, vectors. So there's a lot of things that, that are going on that I think will lead to, to effective therapies, and, and really we're on the cutting edge of neuroscience in many ways. On the flip side, I just wanted to give you a, a couple of slides that just are general slides about clinical trials, their costs, and, and their effectiveness. Uh, this first one is from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, uh, showing the number of new drugs that are approved in the United States every year. So this isn't neurology trials. This isn't ALS. This is every drug for every disease. And you can see, if you look at the y-axis, the average number of new drugs that gets approved every year is on the order of 25 to 30. So there just, you know, there just aren't that many drugs that get developed every year. And the reason for that is that it's hard work and it, it, it's incredibly expensive. And so um, just something for perspective, that, that you, you, you think of these huge drug companies and the many tall buildings in many cities and then realize that, that all of that produces about 25 drugs a year. And then this is also from, from, from the NIH website. It actually comes from the Department of Health and Human Services. And it's an estimate of how many dollars it costs to develop a drug. And it's broken up into early development on the left and, and progressively later development as you go, as you go forward. And, and, so, um, and, and the dollar values are in millions. So, so if, you, if you look at, you know, the, there's a beginning cost in choosing to develop or not develop a compound. Uh, and then there's a preclinical phase where uh, the drugs are tested in animals and in, 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 in what are called in vitro models, either in stem cells or, or different cell lines or, or other, other ways of looking at activity. Then there are phase one trials, which are early safety trials, phase two trials, which are slightly more extensive trials looking at both safety and, and, and target engagement. And then finally, a phase three trial that, that will ultimately determine whether your drug can, potentially can be marketed or not. And by the time you get up there, which is the top left portion of the curve, you've spent about a billion dollars. Now, it's the cheapest thing to do is to quit at the beginning. I mean, you, you, if you abandon your drug at the development stage, it's very cheap. But, but, um, but just to, again, show that, that, that although um, 
in the U.S. anyway, we, we spend time talking about how avaricious and greedy the drug companies are. Drug development is actually a very expensive business. So having said that, there's a ton of drugs out here to, 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 to be talked about. And, <clears throat> excuse me, and, and, and this list is, 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 I've given talks like this over the course of the last 10 years or so, and, and this is the longest list yet. And so uh, I'll be talking about a number of these, uh, but Adavarone is a drug that's approved in Japan and is, is being considered for approval in the U.S., and I'll talk about that. Mesitinib is currently in, tri in trials in, in Europe. Uh, Tiracemtiv is the subject of, right now, the only major phase three study in, in, in the U.S. and Western Europe. Um, and, and so the, the list is, is, is quite long in terms of, of drugs that are either being tested now or, or just about to be tested. And then on the, on the, on the bottom part, uh, right part of, of, of the screen are all sorts of other things, including mesenchymal stem cells, uh, uh, neural-based stem cells, uh, viral ve gene vectors, uh, a whole host, of, and, and, and antisense oligonucleotides, which are, are ways of modifying the genetic expression of, of in, in, in inherited disease. So there's just a lot of things that, that are being tried right now. So it's, it's, it really is an encouraging time. So I'm going to just review the ones that, that I think may be the closest to seeing clinical use and, and perhaps the most exciting, although you never know until the end of a, of a, of a, of a clinical trial program. Uh, the first one is, is a drug that actually is in use in Japan right now. It's called the Derivone, or Radicut is the trade name. And unfortunately, we, we know less about this than, than I'd, I'd like to be able to know. Um, this is actually a, a copy of a press release, um, which is the, the, the uh, uh, Mitsubishi Tanabe, uh, which is the company that, that makes Radicut, their announcement that it, they've received approval for using it in Japan. Uh, and, but but we, know, we know something about it. I mean, there's been a couple of papers. It's something called a free radical scavenger. Free radicals are, are, are sort of end products of, of metabolism and, and can be toxic in the body. And there are a whole host of, of ways that the body has to get rid of these kinds of toxic uh, byproducts of, of energy metabolism. And, 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 and Adarivone reduces the burden of this. This was thought to be important, actually, um, because of, of a fortuitous dis uh, d discovery, which is that the first gene to be discovered that was causative for ALS, the superoxide dismutase gene, is, is a very powerful free radical scavenger. And so that sort of brought to, 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 to awareness the idea that this could be an important mechanism in ALS. Um, there are, are some data in, in the ALS mouse that suggests that it had an effect. And there have been two studies on people, and I can describe one of them because it's been published. The other one I can only tell you about in, in, in rough detail because it's never, it, it has not been, been published. And so the one that has been published involved 250 patients approximately in Japan. Um, and of those 256 patients, about 200 were deemed eligible for the study. And they were equally divided into receiving a single dose of a, a single dose level of a Daravone versus placebo. So this was a placebo-controlled trial, and they were st they were treated for six months, and the outcome measures that were me that were looked at were survival. Uh, the mo the commonly used study that, uh, uh, measure that that we use in many trials called, uh, called the ALS functional rating scale, breathing capacity, and a couple of other things. And so. The summary for this study was that this was a negative trial. There were no statistically significant effects on any measure in this, in this, uh, um, in, in this study. However, virtually all of the outcome measures, and I'm showing you the ALS-FRS, which is the functional rating scale that we use commonly, virtually every, every measure looked a little bit like this, meaning that if you divided the patients after you analyzed them into patients that were diagnosed as having definite ALS, and Definite ALS in, in, in experimental trial terms means ALS involving three body regions, head, arms, and legs. Or probable ALS, meaning ALS that involves two body regions, either head and arm, you can, you, you can do the rest. Or possible ALS, which or probable lab support, laboratory supported ALS, which are, is ALS involving two body regions but requiring an EMG to make that diagnosis. And, and um, you remember the, an EMG is that test where people stick needles in your muscles and ask you to move. And so 
if you look at the, at the difference in, those, in, in, in these three groups, um, there's a tendency for the treated patients in all three groups to do a little bit better on the drug than on the placebo. And the amount of change, if you look at the difference between the two, the two bars, the amount of change is bigger in the definite group and, than the probable, and bigger in the probable group than the laboratory supported. So that was one thing they observed. The other thing that they observed was that uh, patients who had a very short time between starting the study and diagnosis did well as well. So that the two kinds of patients that did the best in this study were people with definite ALS who had just been diagnosed, who, who, had, who were, were very close to their diagnosis. So they actually did a smart thing. They said, well, if that's the group that this drug potentially is the most sensitive at treating, let's do another study where, where, where we only study those people. So the, this second study was also a six-month study, but the criteria for getting into the study was that you had a very short time between the onset of your disease and starting the study, and that you had def definite ALS, meaning ALS involving all three regions of, of, of the neuraxis. And so they did that, and they've reported this data, these data at a number of scientific meetings, and, 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 and the graphs look pretty good. And what they report is that there were both meaningful, clinically meaningful changes and statistically significant changes that suggested that Radicut had a positive effect. Again, over six months, in about 110 or 120 patients. That study has not been published yet, but on the basis of that study, Japan's version of the FDA approved, approved the drug. And on the basis of that study, the US FDA has accepted an application for a, a new drug approval in, in the US. And we should learn about whether, whether or not they're going to require additional studies in the US or whether it's going to be approved in, in, in 2017. We should learn that sometime in the next three to six months. So whether this is really a drug that's ready for prime time or not, I'm uncertain, but we'll have an answer in terms of whether it's going to be available uh, in, 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 a few, in a few months. So I think, think I've said all this. So the, the second drug I'd like to talk about is a drug called Tiracemptive. And, and uh, this is, this is a, 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 a drug that um, has been the product of, 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 of a large number of, of studies in, in, in ALS patients. And because neurologists don't do surgery and we don't have videos and things like that, whenever I have the chance to use any kind of video, I will. And, and so this is actually a cartoon that uh, is created by, by, by Cytokinetics, the, the company that has discovered uh, the Tiracentum that is, is sponsoring its development, showing how muscles work. And oops, it got too big. That's too, so, so anyway, what, the way muscles work is that there are these two filaments that interlace, and there are these things called foot pads, which are the orangey blobby things. And, they, and, they, and the muscle activates by pulling together and shortening the muscle, and, and that's how, how, how muscles are activated. And Tiracentum Increase, activates that ability. It, incre it, 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 it increases the sensitivity of the muscle to a very important ion called calcium and increases the duration of muscle contraction and to some extent the, 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 the maximum amount. Now, here's another, so this is heart muscle and this is not tiraceptive. Um, but but this is this is we, this is a, a more relevant movie because this is actually looking at a, an ultrasound of the heart with a drug that has the same mechanism of action, just on heart muscle. And it's uh, I think if you look at, at the, the two left hand panels versus the two right hand panels, the, the the left and right are the same patient either off this drug or on this drug, and I think you can see especially on the bottom right versus the bottom left that little valve that's flopping up and down, which is one of the valves in the heart. Is, is moving much more uh, extensively on the, on the right side than the left side, which is a demonstration of the increased activation that this heart muscle drug is having on the heart. And, and, this, and it's, so this drug is also in, in development in, in, if, uh, in, in, in for use in heart failure. So we can't, I don't have a movie for that, but, 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 but the, the exact same thing happens in our, our skeletal muscle. So do I have a laser? I do. So this experiment is on normal human volunteers you can stimulate a nerve right there, and that nerve controls the ability to bring your, your ankle up like that. And you can measure the force with this little force meter. And this, is, this, this graph looks at the, the, the frequency of nerve stimulation. So our muscles get, get stimulated more the faster they're stimulated. And this is, these, this is the rates of stimulation here. 
And this is the amount of extra force that's produced with the drug as opposed to without the drug. And so each darker green is a higher dose. And you can see that there's a tendency for increased muscle activation to be produced in normal human volunteers with this drug. And as you bring the dose up, the force of the change gets greater. So this is actually very exciting to people like me because it's the one demonstration of a, of a, of a mechanism of action that we actually know and can prove works in human beings. So whether or not this works in ALS, that's our question. That's, that's what, the, the, what, the, what the experiments will, will, will show. But the drug actually has an effect. And so this is a summary of the, the, the most recent study that was, was done just before the phase three study called Benefit ALS, which was a three-month study um, in, 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 in patients with ALS. Um, and, that, and this is something called a forest plot. So this, this line here is no effect. Any point on the left is, is bad. It favors the placebo over the, over the drug. Any point on the right is good. And the, the primary outcome measure was actually this ALS function, functional rating scale, which did not show a significant change. So formally, this was a negative study. But if you look at two important measures, vital capacity, which is a measure of breathing strength, and strength itself, megascore, is, is a quantitative summary of all of your extremity muscles. Those both were on the right, meaning there's, it favored tear and these error bars didn't cross this zero line, meaning that it's statistically significant as well. So, 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 so this is actually one of the first studies that I'm aware of that actually showed a statistically significant and potentially clinically meaningful effect in ALS. And so as a result of that, um, a phase three study called Vitality ALS is now being conducted. It's going to look at placebo versus three different doses of, 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 of tirosemptive, looking at change in breathing capacity at six months, but then changes in muscle strength, uh, the, the, the risk of, of, of declining significantly in breathing, and survival over the course of almost a year. And so that trial has completed enrollment, so all the patients that, are, are going, that we need for that trial are in that trial, and it, that, was, that was completed in August of, of this year. So we should know sometime next year what, whether this is, is an effective treatment for ALS. So just briefly, I, I talked about the fact that we have genetic treatments for some patients with ALS. And, and, and th there are two mutations that, although there are many more than that that cause ALS, those two mutations cause more than half of the, the, the clearly inherited disease that exists in, in ALS. One is the SOD1 gene, and the, the other is the C9-ORF72 gene. And so once you have a, a, a gene identified that, that you know is responsible for the disease, there are two ways that it can be responsible. It can be responsible because it's, the mutation is actively damaging you, or it can be responsible because the mutation is, is making not enough of what that gene is supposed to make, and so you, you have a loss of function. And for both of these, these genes, at least some of the activity, and probably most, comes from the first mechanism, which is that the mutation makes a bad protein that actually is physically, that causes the disease. And there's this new technique called antisense oligonucleotides, Started, this company here is sort of the, the founder of the, or, or the, one, the, the company that's developed most of this technology. Um, you can see it has a bit of an unfortunate name, um, and they've changed it now to Ionis, but they still, everybody thinks of them as, as ISIS. Um, but uh, um, but, but they, they've been developing these, 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 these compounds called antisense oligonucleotides basically to shut off the genes. And so there's a, a study now going on sponsored by Biogen and Ionis uh, looking at the SOD1 antisense. Next year, there will be a study looking at the c 9 or 72 gene. And this is a completely new way of tre treating ALS. It won't affect the majority of patients, unfortunately, because most patients don't have these mutations. But it, it, it has the potential for being very important in terms of our understanding about how to change disease. And it's also possible that if, if we can treat inherited disease, it will give us significant clues as to how, how to treat disease that isn't inherited. So I'm going to talk a little bit about a different set of, of medications that um, are similar in that they're all addressing the same kind of mechanism. So one of the things that we've learned in the last probably five to 10 years is that it's more and more obvious that at many times in, during, during the progress of ALS, the immune system is important and that there's either 
excess immune activation, too much inflammation, but not just general inflammation, it's very specific. And so there's a couple things that we know about. Um, macrophages or microglia in the brain are changed in ALS in a way that makes them actively damaging to, to brain cells. And we also know that, that um, there's other forms of the innate immune response, the, 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 the response to for, usually that's directed to viruses and bacteria, but that, but that can be directed against our own bodies. The, these, these mechanisms are abnormal in ALS. And so even though they may not be the cause of ALS, the fact that these processes are going on while people are getting sicker means that they may be good targets to change how people progress. And this summarizes the, one of the main mechanisms that was, is, we think may be important. Microglia, are, which are the same as macrophages in the, in the central nervous system, can be either neuroprotective or actively damaging. That's what cytotoxic means. And they can convert back and forth. And so if you could convert the bad cells into the good cells, you might be able to modify uh, how people do once they get ALS. And this is a, a study looking at and sort of, this is sort of a non sequitur, but not really. This is a, a way of looking at inflammation in the body called C-reactive protein. And it turns out that an observation was made that patients with more aggressive disease have higher levels of C-reactive protein than patients with less aggressive disease. This one I can skip. And there's this very interesting drug called NP001, which for those... <laughs> It's a very simple molecule. It's actually the active ingredient in borax, so that it's the stuff that you clean your kitchen floors with. But um, it, it is very effective at taking the, these, these, these macrophages and turning them from the, the, the damaging state to the protective state. And these, this is blood from three different patients showing that with NP001, you can increase this level, which is the, a level that's associated with the neuroprotective phase of macrophages. So NP001 has already been tested in, in, in about 150 patients. And this is a similar study with respect to the data that for, in terms of radicut. Because, so this, this all just shows, to say that there's placebo and two doses of NP001, again studied for six months. And this, again, was a negative study in terms of statistical significance. Um, there were no changes that actually statistically significant said, yes, this, this drug works. But if you compared placebo to the low dose to the high dose, and the number of patients that did not, res did not change over the course of the entire six months, there were more of them in the higher dose than in placebo. And if you just looked at the slope, the rate of change of this ALS rate rating scale, it was fastest with the placebo, second fastest with, with the low dose, and slowest with the, with, the, with the highest dose. So again, a hint. And I showed you that data about CRP. Then they went back as a post hoc. They looked, at the, they looked at the data, and they said, let's just look at people with levels of high inflammation as, as diagnosed by high levels of this, this blood, blood activity measure called CRP. And if they looked at just the people with higher than average CRP and looked at the decline in time of the ALSFRS, Again, this is placebo, low dose, and high dose. This difference is both potentially clinically meaningful, but was also statistically significant. So a hint may be that there is something in here that, that, that specifically relates to people with high levels of inflammation. And so there's a current study that's enrolling patients now. Again, it will be a six-month study. And the goal is to look at patients with high levels of this inflammatory marker and see if that second observation can be reproduced. So people will enter the study, get a blood test that measures this CRP level, and will be allowed to go forward with, with, the, with this study if they're higher than average. And, and this study hopefully will be enrolled within the first half of next year. So I think this is a, a, a quite an interesting approach. Another one is one that you may have heard of because it, it was a subject of a lot of press releases and a fair amount of publicity. It's a drug called mesitinib. And it's something called the tyrosine kinase inhibitor. But its activity, its, its action is very similar to NP001 in, t in terms of what it's intended to do. It's basically, and you can show this in animals, it takes macrophages, the ones that can be protective or, or, or damaging, and, tr and, and, and pushes them towards the protective state. And this is just a couple of, of data from, from, from animals, the SOD1 ALS rat, showing that if you give mesitinib at 
varying doses, the higher doses do better, at, well, actually both doses do better than the placebo. And you can look, if, if, you, if you look at the cells in those animals, the, cell, the, the, the motor neurons are protected in the spinal cord. This is another drug that we know nothing about clinically, except that, that last spring it was announced that they're doing a 400 patient trial. 200 patients had finished a year's worth of treatment and they announced that their interim results suggested that there was a, both a statistically significant and clinically meaningful effect on multiple measures. Unfortunately, that's all we know. And, and, and this is one of the cautions about um, over-interpretation from, from press releases because we, we, we have no idea what, what, what the data actually look like. But it's 200 patients studied for a year is a pretty good sized study. So if, if in fact the results are as encouraging as their press release suggests, that would be a good thing to know about. So this just talks about the press release. And so they're, 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 they're at least talking about doing a study in the a second study in the US and Europe, which would be the appropriate next step. And, um, and we'll see. And so I'm going to skip my last study because it's, pretty, it's a pretty small study and basically conclude that, that I think we're in, ex in an exciting time. I, 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 I've been giving ALS talks like this for a lot of years. I, I actually truly feel much more opt optimistic about the spectrum of ways that we're attacking ALS than I ever did. I think there are going to be dr drugs in the next few years that probably won't cure the disease, but will meaningfully change the way people progress with this disease and improve, improve people's quality, qual qualities of life. And I look forward to being able to, to, to actually describing this in, 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 at some point in the near future. So thank you, and, and I'll take some questions if you need. And I, I